thank you thank you arvind for the kind introduction uh, first uh, i'd like to thank uh, uh, devopedia and uh, the 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 whole team behind devopedia for inviting us to share some of the exciting work that we are doing at uh, flockx um, and i also want to really appreciate uh, people taking time off on a friday evening uh, i think uh, friday evening uh, there were hundreds of other things to do but uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving time to to listen into what we've been do doing we are very excited to talk about uh, the tech that we do at flockx and uh, uh, so as arvind introduced uh, i am uh, suchi um, i am a part of the technology team at flockx uh, where uh, i mean we are essentially trying to reimagine everything goat right uh, so most of you uh, who uh, are non vegetarians would know that if uh, biryani is the quintessential uh, 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 non vegetarian kind of a delicacy uh, then the top uh, then the top end of the biryani would be mutton biryani uh, but uh, if you really uh, see the journey of how uh, uh, a goat uh, from when it is uh, uh, raised bred and all the way it comes to your plate it's a very complex journey and uh, uh, this journey uh, especially is relevant in india where a lot of marginal farmers uh, raise goats as a part of their livelihood but uh, uh, more importantly i think uh, it's a it's a it's a an organized sort of a value chain that is ripe for disruption using technology and uh, uh, in that sense i think uh, uh, the ethos of uh, what we are trying to do at flockx is to essentially build the full stack goat ecosystem uh, and disrupt uh, uh, this whole unorganized nature of uh, uh, goat raising all the way trading to reaching your plate and we are doing that using technology and the power of data and um, uh, and I, i hope today i will be able to give you a glimpse of some of the exciting things that we are doing uh, as a part of uh, this change that we want to bring about right uh, so quickly as uh, mr arvin said uh, i am uh, uh, in terms of my background i have over uh, one and a half decade of experience uh, uh, at the intersection of ai ml software uh, and uh, biomedicine um, and uh, uh, i have a phd in computer science uh, and uh, over the uh, last one and a half decades uh, i have built uh, solutions products built large technology teams and uh, uh, chasing impact and scale as they call it right uh so today uh, essentially i'm also joined by my team uh, uh manju who's the founder and ceo as well as uh, uh, uh aryaman who who does a lot of the technology uh, magic that i'm going to talk to you about today and uh, today the goal uh, that i uh, that i have in mind for this talk is twofold uh one is of course to give you a glimpse of what we are doing at clockx uh, to give you the breadth of how we are reimagining uh uh you know disruption of this goat ecosystem using technology uh and second is uh, uh specifically talking to you about uh this new piece of technology that we have built which is uh, how do you id or uniquely id goats right and uh, uh and uh, i hope to take you on this journey to to kind of uh, give you a glimpse of how we solutioned it all the way to how we are using it uh so before that uh, before going deep into the technology aspects of uh, face id itself uh, i want to uh, uh kind of motivate uh, uh i mean the kind of opportunity that we are sitting on right uh, so just uh, uh, the goat uh Uh, ecosystem in uh, india itself is a 16 billion dollar market right uh, uh, 
just in terms of numbers, it's larger than larger than the chicken ecosystem, and uh, over 225 million goats and sheep in India alone, right? And uh, if you really think about uh, uh, goats, sheep, and livestock in this space, I mean. Uh, this is essentially the lifeline of farmers, uh, marginal farmers in India, right? Uh, and uh, so, so uh, it holds a very special value, especially in context of in in Bharat, if I can call it, right? And uh, 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 at Flockex, we take inspiration from history, uh, specifically the transformation of chicken industry in the 1960s. Uh, so this industry, pretty much like how the gold industry is today was fragmented, it was unorganized, and it was inefficient. Uh, and uh, very much like how the chicken industry has literally transformed uh, and uh, largely commoditized and industrialized, I think uh, that is the huge opportunity that we see in the goat sector. And uh, 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 once you spend a lot of time in the space, you will understand that the major issues that are plaguing this industry is the lack of standardization, uh, the lack of uh, 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 organization in the whole value chain, right? And uh, uh, this is one of those uh, uh, glaring moments when you really see the disconnect between the technological prowess of uh, India, if I can call that, and the rural Bharat, right? And uh, for us, I think this is a space where it's ripe for disruption uh, with technology. And uh, before I go into sort of uh, the opportunity itself, I, I, I want to also talk about some of the issues that we see in this ecosystem. So if you are somebody who is breeding or farming goats, uh, some of the issues that you have is high mortality uh, in goats. Right, and uh, uh, grazing is hard, uh, and also stall feeding is usually not viable. And in India, we are also plagued by low meat yield and also low milk yield in goats, right? Uh, similarly, the productivity of kidding, which means every time a uh, goat gives birth, the number of kids that is given uh, birth to is again lower in India, right? Uh, and add on to it the lack of good quality feed. And all of this points to a very ad hoc approach of how farming is done, goat farming is done in India. There's no scientific uh, approach to it. There are no uh, technology interventions that can uh, play a role to really elevate the game for goat farming. Uh, similarly, in goat trading, uh, which is uh, uh, if, if you really see this map, you will see a lot of consumption uh, hubs are in southern India, while a lot of production hubs are in the northern India. And so usually uh, trade happens where these farmers come to mandis, uh, 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 where they would bring their goats traveling long distances. Uh, and then you would have buyers also come into these mandis and uh, trade happening there. Again, if you visit a Mandi, you would see uh, huge issues in this uh, ecosystem. One is extremely large number of uh, middlemen who are really not adding much value to this whole ecosystem. Severe lack of transparency, uh, lack of an understanding of the quality, quantity and pricing of uh, the, the animals and hence the meat. There are lack of uh, standards and uh, distress sales and arbitrage are also very common, right? Now, this is really the opportunity slide that we sit on. And what is it that we aspire to do, right? Our goal at FlockX is to really build what we call, call the super goal, which is essentially a, a goat which is known for its quality, uh, assured quantity, and ethically raised, and doing it at scale, right? Uh, and how are we going to do it? Using technology and data. 
and uh, uh, we are building proprietary technology uh, for breeding as well as trading super goats in India, right? Uh, we want to really tap into that $16 billion market and uh, uh, we really hope to be a major player there uh, in India. Now, uh, the opportunity as I outlay, uh, we see the key to really realizing the potential of uh, uh, this huge opportunity is with technology, right? So for us, technology is the enabler, the unifier, also the propeller, right? And we are looking at technology in two pieces. Uh, one is digital technologies. Uh, uh, and uh, here we are working on our own hardware. Uh, so think of a device which uh, before uh, uh, a goat is sent uh, uh, for getting mutton out of it, you can gauge uh, accurately what's the yield of meat in that goat. Now that is essentially a central piece to how we can organize this whole sector, right? Uh, similarly, how do you uniquely identify a goat? Uh, you will see that there is a lot of um, issues during transit of these goats, right? And uh, goats are essentially high value products, right? So a goat usually sells for 7,000, 8,000 rupees, depending on its size. And, and, and so it's almost like gold, they would call it in rural India, right? So to uniquely identify a goat uh, is important uh, to regularize the value chain. And for this, we are developing face ID. And uh, uh, really, I mean, what our goal is to essentially create what we call as the go to S, uh, where uh, we are able to extensively collect and use data to uh, drive the whole uh, 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 space, right? Right from how should I be breeding it? What is the kind of food that I should be feeding the goats to how I should be transporting them? What should be the right value for a goat in the market? Uh, uh, all the way to, you know, what's the quality of the meat that you're eating should all be ensured by technology, right? So this is on the digital side of things. Uh, the second is biotechnology interventions. Uh, these are more around um, uh, the farming issues uh, related to, hey, I want high yielding uh, goats, right? Which have a high uh, protein content or meat content. Uh, how do I ensure uh, the, the the female goats are more uh, productive. By that I mean it is able to produce maximum kids uh, every year, right? Uh, can I do interventions around precision farming and nutrition, right? All of this necessitates data, and uh, uh, what we are trying to do is to build this whole ecosystem uh, of data technology and. Uh, and the right biotechnological interventions to disrupt this uh, ecosystem, right? Now, uh, coming back uh, to sort of uh, the discussion point of today's uh, uh, talk. Uh, so today I will be talking about uh, how we have developed the face identification for goats. I mean, this is very similar. I think all of us are recipients of face identification right from when you open, uh, uh, unlock your phone. Uh, every device uh, has a face identification module. Now for us, uh, especially in the goat value chain, this was paramount because uh, uh, standardizing the supply chain of goats uh, required every animal to be uniquely identified. And uh, while there are existing solutions uh, which uh, are used to identify goats, such as ear tags, RFID tags, or toe clippings. Uh, usually uh, they have issues such as, of course, some of them are more expensive. Uh, most biggest issue is they are not foolproof. Uh, there are always ways you find around how you can rig the whole system where uh, the goat that you were interested in can easily be exchanged with another inferior goat uh, in, a, in a trade setup. 
right? Uh, and also a punching of ears usually results in fever and weight loss. Uh, and uh, in, spe in special contexts such as in halal slaughtering, uh, animals which with defects are usually uh, sort of rejected, if I can use that word. So the, the, the problem statement that we had is while all of these current solutions exist, uh, the quintessential uh, uh, solution is there in every uh, trader or farmer's pocket, which is a set, which is a smartphone, right? And uh, 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 nowadays, uh, thanks to uh, the data liberalization as well as uh, uh, the the percolation of mobile phones, smart mobile phones in India, um, I think uh, uh, having an app, if I can use that word, which can help in essentially this whole identification piece of goats, I think that will go a long way uh, in, in helping us uh, standardize this whole process. And that's sort of a thought process of uh, when we were conceiving uh, uh, whether it's even uh, uh, worthy of a, an exercise to do this, right? So uh, what is the solution that we have come up with? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's essentially a biometric identification uh, for goats, uh, which is based on its its uh, its face facial features, uh, and uh, the way we do it is uh, uh, using machine learning and AI, if I can use that term. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea is essentially that uh, is the is is the bottom part of the slide, which is you take uh, multiple pictures of a goat and compute a unique representation of that goat's uh, identity uh, as a vector or embedding. And uh, this embedding is unique to that goat. And uh, uh, we've seen that uh, it's quite a robust uh, 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 framework as well of being able to identify goats uniquely. Of course, goat identification also has applications uh, beyond just uh, uniquely identifying goats. Uh, we are also thinking of applications around, hey, can I tell whether a goat is healthy or not, or what breed of goats are there and so on and so forth, right? And this is uh, leading up to my next slide. Uh, so if you had such a technology, right, which is you just take a cell phone, you uh, are able to ID a goat, what are the kind of uh, applications uh, that such a technology could have to uh, really regularize this whole goat ecosystem. One is, as I told, health monitoring, uh, tracking the vaccinations, disease control, uh, optimizing breeding, which means you could pick the right goats for breeding uh, uh, exercises. The second big application is in agriculture insurance. Uh, 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 I think uh, uh, for those who don't know, uh, insuring goats is a is a is a big business opportunity in the livestock space. Uh, so here again, uh, uh, aspects of risk assessment and claim processing uh, require uniquely identifying goats, and I think uh, having a handle of that uh, is again transformational. In goat trading, uh, as I said uh, during. Uh, the trade and the transportation, goats can very easily be replaced uh, and uh, what the buyer actually paid for is not the goat that he gets. So so checking the provenance of, of the actual goats is a key uh, uh, advantage in goat trading as well as integration with the marketplace. Uh, and, and the larger other applications are farm to, tra farm to table traceability. So you exactly know what is the goat, the mutton, where it was sourced from, what is the journey the animal has had right from when it was born all the way to when it came to your table. Uh, uh, we can also focus on differential nutrition management. Let's say there are certain goats in your farm which has very specialized needs for nutrition. Managing that nutrition programs when you're able to uniquely identify goats is interesting. Uh, so, so the kind of applications uh, uh, and uh, uh, opportunities that can be uh, harnessed out of having a base phase technology are quite a bit. 
we have started to explore some of these and in fact we are uh, also very bullish on working with partners to build some of these apps uh, uh, based on face id technology now uh, before I go into the details of the technology and what are the uh, under the hood uh, elements, I want to give you a couple of video demos. Um, so the first one is when in the wild uh, we are registering a goat. So uh, I think of it as uh, this is a goat that you want to register, assign it an ID. So that's the first workflow. The second workflow is uh, I have a database of goats. Now I need to identify a given goat as being uh, uh, uniquely corresponding to an ID. So the first video is what you're seeing here is uh, the app that we have. Uh, the bounding box is uh, has to be shown in to the to the face of the goat. Uh, the app is actually scanning the goat, and what it's uh, are doing here is it has found where the face is of the goat. It's also found the landmarks, which is the eyes. In our case, we just use very simple landmarks, which is just the eyes as well as the mouth region. And uh, it takes a few pictures of the goats while the user is flashing uh, uh, it on its face. And one, once it's done, it's gotten enough images of the goat while it's registering. Uh, it would then show a page where you put in the weight, what's it, its breed, uh, whether it was a male or female. I mean, the, the list is endless on what you want to track, but this is registering a goat. Now, let's say you've registered the goat. The goat is in your DB, right? Uh, now, how do you find a goat, right? now? The same goat that I just registered. Now let's say the goat was something that I bought. Now I transported it to Bangalore. Now in Bangalore, I need to be sure this is the same goat that I purchased, right? So now the use 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 case would be that uh, it's taking a photo of the goat. It's checking against a database uh, of whether this goat was already there and Voila, it figured out that this was a goat that was sourced in Anantpur on the 17th July, right? So uh, this is essentially the technology in action uh, to show you a glimpse of how this whole thing works. Now, if I really go under the hood uh, and talk about the key components of face ID technology, uh, essentially, as I said, it's a machine learning algorithm. Uh, so that's the central piece. But uh, uh, I think for the success, the business success of Face ID as a technology, I think the first two boxes uh, are the key. So let me just go over this whole workflow. So it starts with data collection, uh, where we went on a journey to massively collect, uh, and I think I can confidently say the world's largest uh, GOAT data set. Uh, that uh, uh, we have been able to collect. Uh, uh, and and uh, this is the key to our success because this is a data that uh, is very painstakingly created uh, and uh, an asset that is crucial to our face IDs uh, uh, accuracy. So the way we do it is we focus on goat faces uh, uh, and we collect both videos and images. Uh, we also capture metadata related to breed and sex of the goat. Uh, we also account for real world complexities around lighting, surroundings, variation of cameras, all of that into our data collection phase. Once we are able to collect a lot of data around goat faces, what we do next is annotate or label this data. Uh, and in our case, the labeling involves uh, marking the facial region of a goat, as well as marking the key uh, uh, points inside a, get, a goat's face, which, uh, as I told before, correspond to its eye as well as its mouth regions. Right? Again, this is uh, uh, largely a manual step, uh, right? Where uh, we focus on the quality of annotations. So once we have these two uh, uh, pieces done. Uh, 
our next step is uh, model building and um, uh, we use an ensemble of multiple models and I, I will go over uh, uh, the broad principles of these models next. Uh, next is on model deployment. Of course, model deployment is easier said than done. Uh, uh, how the model is deployed is usually driven by the use case uh, uh, or the UX of the end use case. For an insurance use case, the model could be deployed completely differently vis-a-vis uh, uh, a more offline kind of a setup. Uh, how these models will be served, whether it will be uh, uh, served on a mobile or it, will it be served on a cloud? Uh, uh, once it's deployed, how do I monitor whether the model is doing well? Uh, because usually uh, there is the saying that uh, all models when they are first deployed to production are 100% wrong because they usually never uh, 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 there is what is called a data drift or a model drift where the distribution of the data that you trained on and real life data usually changes. Uh, so monitoring the model becomes important. And let's say you see that the model performance is degrading, then you sort of create a framework when you are able to automatically retrain and continually fine tune these models. And uh, 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 this is essentially what's happening under the hood. Now I will go into each of these components uh, one by one. Uh, first is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, data collection, which is our biggest asset. Uh, and again, for this, we've built uh, a app, uh, which is uh, uh, a data collection app. Uh, uh, and one of the things that we realized uh, as being important for success of creating the face ID is having very strict standard operating procedures. Uh, we saw that previous studies, academic studies, which were trying to do GOAT face IDs, were using data sets that were low quality. They, once we took those algorithms and tried it on our setup, they usually had very low performance. And we realized all of this was because of the way the data was collected in these applications. So we had a very strict SOP of how data should be collected. So we used to deploy our agents in mundis and in farms who used to follow these strict SOPs. And we built an app, an in-house app, which actually ensured adherence to these SOPs. So what you see here is uh, four screenshots of the app where uh, we are doing a flock level, a day level collection uh, of uh, uh, data uh, and even while I'm collecting data, uh, the the end the, the the staff who is actually collecting the data is forced to collect data in multiple angles. So, for instance, the last uh, panel that you see here uh, talks about, hey, take a photo from the frontal shot, from the side angle, take a video of a 360. Right? All of this is almost gamified. He has to finish all of this for the data to be fully stored for a particular goat. So, having done this. Uh, uh, for over one, one and a half year now. Uh, I think we can confidently say that we have the world's largest data set for goat images uh, and videos. And this data set uh, is almost thought from a future proofing point of view, which is why we collect data extensively, not just for the here and now of how the algorithms work. Uh, so the next one uh, is, as I told you, data annotation. Again, we built an in-house uh, application for doing data annotation. Again, we had very strict SOPs uh, where our annotators uh, had to mark for every goat image that they see in an image, mark the face region, mark the eye and mouth region. They had to also give a score for how good the quality of the image was, whether it was taken from a phone where there was some sort of, let's say, uh, uh, a, a distortion or let's say the quality of the camera itself was low and also they had to ID each code. So these two essentially became the, the central piece around which uh, we then uh, built the algorithms. Uh, coming to the algorithms itself, uh, so uh, as I told you uh, or uh, I didn't tell you, but we've already filed for a patent for our uh, uh, face ID technology and uh, uh, 
there is no one single model it's an ensemble of multiple models that work for for different uh, nuances of how you id the code uh, right uh, and uh, so it but it essentially consists of these five steps right one is there is an algorithm that first detects the code then it detects the face inside the code once it detects the face it detects the key points on that face where is the eye where is the mouth within that face uh, then there are some image transformations that happen on that goat face then once we have that uh, we learn robust embeddings of this image and uh, uh, we combine multiple images of a goat and learn a unique representation for every goat right and and that's essentially uh, the model backend uh, uh, and and that's sort of our magic sauce as well so once we do the model training uh, uh, i mean we have these ensemble of models and this is some results of really uh, uh, how these models perform so what you see here uh, in this panel is the first code is the query image and uh, the second uh, uh, image is the closest match that it found to the query image and uh, uh, you, we find that even in the wild the the models do quite well right now this is a very emp empirical notion that i have uh, now really coming to number crunching um, so for instance the phase detection model that i showed you this is the precision recall curve which is used in machine learning to tell you how good your model is uh, the accuracy is roughly 96 97% similarly for detecting the eye or mouth regions we are at uh, 95 96% that's sort of where our models are in terms of the accuracy uh, now in terms of the whole pipelines efficiency what you see uh, in the panel below is uh, the accuracy for registering a goat uh, it's about 96% and uh, the accuracy for finding a goat is at 95 96% right and uh, the graph that you see here on the on the bottom right side is actually uh, plotting a distribution uh, the blue line represents uh, a probability distribution where you are comparing the scores between same goats so let's say you had two images of the same goat and you plot uh, uh, and you have a score which says how close uh, these two goats are uh, and uh, you plot those numbers that's the blue curve and uh, when you do that across goats which means i compare a goat with another goat that's your uh, orange curve right and ideally what you want to see is a clear separations of these two distributions right and uh, uh, today in real life we we see that uh, separation of course there is some kind of overlap that's where uh, our team continuously uh, fine tunes these models and builds the technology so that this gap is uh, sort of increased now if i had to cherry pick single animals and and look at the same metric you would see that these two blue and orange curves are quite separate which means practically uh, we are able to very with a very high precision uh, id goats right that's basically what this slide is telling us right now once we have uh, developed the model as well as uh, uh, the the uh, framework of course the next is uh, deploying these models right and for that uh, as we already spoke about uh, we have uh, developed uh, the apps for it uh, the ux for the app is there is a registration cycle where uh, the end user would register a goat once the registration of the goat happens the second would be to query whether any goat that i am looking at has it already been uh, present in my database right so that's the second step which is uh, match code right uh, and in terms of the technology backend itself um, um, uh, the apps are all uh, react native 
uh, the models are all uh, was were originally trained in PyTorch, which were converted into TF Lite on Android. Uh, we're using the Android camera to API frame processor for uh, collecting the picture as well as overlaying the results of the algorithms on the app. The backend is a uh, MongoDB, and the whole infrastructure that we use is uh, GCP, right? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I spoke about all the great things about uh, how the uh, Face ID technology is, but of course, we also have a lot of challenges uh, uh, that we have to grapple with, right? Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there is quite a bit of variance between camera sensors, right? Because the Android ecosystem is so vast with so many uh, kind of uh, providers uh, uh, who have their own camera sensors. These models have to be fine-tuned based on the camera sensor that is used. Uh, in the wild, we see that people may not necessarily adhere to strict SOPs because when the app is in the hand of the user, uh, uh, we have less control of uh, how they use it. So uh, for these models to work across wild variability in camera angles is something that we continuously work to improve on. Uh, we also uh, see avenues to improve around lighting. So uh, uh, usually some of this trading happens early morning or late in the night, let's say, where the lighting conditions require flash to be used. Uh, uh, while uh, on a sunny day, the images look very different from how a machine sees these images. So these are some other uh, issues also that we uh, uh, have uh, that we are continuously improving uh, uh, in our tech team. So uh, this is sort of a short walkthrough of what we've been doing right, uh, with our Face ID technology. And uh, uh, I think the technology per se is quite stable now. And we are now looking to work with partners uh, uh, to, to see how we can build apps uh, using Face ID technology for uh, uh, leveraging some of the points that I mentioned earlier in my slide. And with this, I'll probably stop. And uh, uh, as I said, I think we are a very small but uh, extremely talented team. Uh, and uh, we, we are looking to expand. And uh, if what we do is interesting, uh, please join us uh, in this GOAT revolution. Uh, please write to us at uh, admin at FlockX. I'll probably stop here and uh, uh, open it up for questions if there are any and uh, or discussions or any comments. Thank you. Thank you, Suchindra, for that uh, wonderful introduction to GoTex and how it works under the hood. I'm sure many of our uh, developers have some questions. So anyone wants to go first? So first is a uh, uh, business question. As you said, the sector is very highly unorganized. Uh, and uh, are your customers educated to you you know to adapt adopt this app? Uh, it's a good question, uh, right? Uh, so, I mean, if I have to be very bluntly answering this, we, we are figuring it out. Right, but I think for us the main use case is uh, le uh, let's say we we run our own farms, right? We we so even in our farms, I think having a face ID tech is extremely valuable. Now, second, coming to the point of the customers, I see multiple user personas using this app, right? Uh, okay. so let's say it's a it's a it's a buyer. Let's say I am in Bangalore. Uh, I need 100 goats every week. I, I have a big butchery, right? Now, today what I do is I don't trust the system. I actually travel every week to the Monday, ensure I pick the goats that I think are perfect for uh, you know the yield that I need or of good quality. 
then you will be surprised the way it's marked is people actually go and paint the goats with a sign of their choice, right? And then they come back to Bangalore and then somebody loads up these goats and ships it to Bangalore, right? This is the flow today. Now, why is this flow, right? It's because there is a lack of trust, right? Now, if you really think about bringing face ID here, which is at the Monday, I'm able to show to the buyer who is probably sitting in Bangalore that, hey, this is the goat. I can assure you this goat is going to produce five, 10 kgs of meat. And I'm telling you this is the ID. And then I transport that. Now, when the buyer at Bangalore is going to get the load, he can check that this is exactly the goats that he paid for. So if you really look at this persona, I think this is a demography that can absolutely use the app. Now, if you go to the persona of farmers, I think, uh, I mean, I don't have enough data to tell you whether it will be useful for the marginal farmer. But I okay. think uh, there are multiple personas in this journey. And we find that uh, we think that a majority of these personas would benefit or be will, will be able to use this app. OK, understood. So for large scale players, this will add value. Agree. And uh, one question with regards to machine learning. How different is this facial recognition from uh, facial recognition for goats is different from facial recognition for humans? And is it difficult or easy? Uh, it's very similar. Let me uh, let me say that, right? Uh, uh, in fact, it's uh, uh, so when we started, we didn't know if we could uh, differentiate goats just based on facial features because uh, for a normal eye, it's already quite hard, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it, right? So in terms of what we use under the hood for these machine learning algorithms, uh, it's very similar to how we do it for a human, right? Uh, 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 the only nuance here is uh, 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 the data augmentation strategies that you would need to use to account for the variations in uh, in the wild, right? Right from lighting to angle variations, because I mean, today uh, uh, an iPhone would tell you exactly you need to face the uh, phone a certain way uh, for it to work, right? Now mm -hmm. you cannot force the goat to do that. So we need to create a more robust kind of a framework where it works across multitude of angles, right? So these are the challenges on top of, let's say, a similar technology that is done for humans. But fundamentally, I would say it's a very similar uh, uh, kind of a tech stack, right? Okay. Now, uh, and which is why I emphasized so much that I think the biggest asset that we have uh, is the data collection and annotation where we took a lot of care on how that is to be built because the success of the face ID is entirely, in my opinion, there because uh, a lot of uh, the machine learning stack are things that we have adapted from things that we already know. I don't know if I answered that question well. Yeah. yeah. That, that makes sense. Thanks. And uh, others can go ahead with the question. And if otherwise, I'll come back with one. Thanks. OK, uh, Radha Krishnan Iyer has raised his hand. Go ahead with your question. Would it be that this should have been a fairly nascent state? Let's put it that way, this type of thing, in terms of the equity, I'm sure, or implications of it. Uh, sorry, but I don't the whole the uh, whole methodology. Your uh, voice is not clear. Can you just uh, try again? Uh, okay, fine. Is are you able to hear me now? Yeah. 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 Would it be right to say that this is uh, all this is in a fairly nascent state? Uh, uh, let's put it this way in terms of its applications uh, to different agricultural methods or products or, or different concepts. Yeah, yes and no. Uh, so the part where it's yes really? is I think uh, I think the face ID technology is quite robust now as we have it, which means uh, the ability to ID a goal. Hey, some mobile phones also do have it, right? Some mobile phones also do have it, right? Yeah, even even I mean we do we do these tests on our mobile phones only. So we, we've already deployed these applications on mobile phones now. Where it, where I think there is scope for, where we have, where it's, uh, where we have not done much, is building applications uh, 
specific for use cases which can leverage face id and that is at nascent stage because uh, we spent the last one one and a half year perfecting the technology now uh, i think we are now looking for partners to kind of uh, take a use case where we can embed this technology and really empower that use case so that is at an nascent stage but the technology itself of id in boats i think uh, we are fairly confident that uh, it has reached a, a a point where it can be deployed great wonderful wonderful so it's a lot got to be the facial recognition aspect of things moment thing else right yeah. framing and all that right yeah. Yeah. And, so 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 the, so the way i see yeah so the way i see it is let's say for an insurance use case uh, uh, i mean there is a current flow of how let's say a good insurance happens right now face id is going to be that enabler which is going to kind of streamline that whole process right or bring order to that now we have not worked on the insurance piece yet but then it would be about using this face id to work with an insurance provider on solution in that part that's the part where we are entering into uh yeah so i think yeah so i think that's so, uh, so i mean a lot of this involves a lot of like putting cameras in on that so you take like bits and like dots pictures of things and then relate to each other that's sort of thing, isn't it? yeah yeah right exactly so there is a question okay. online okay before we go to that uh, srinivasan has a question srinivasan go ahead yeah i would like to ask a question like uh, like how large was the data set i mean uh, okay so so um, so today we already have uh, around 7 to 8000 goats already in our data set right so for every goat you are looking at all of the 13 sets right videos images uh but for us it never stops as i told you because uh, uh as we start using the app everything that goes into the app gets collected annotated and gets into the refinement mode of our application so for us we reached a critical mass around that 6000 7000 goats which would translate into you multiply that so about 80000 90000 images right because for every goat we we roughly have about 10 images right and then we also have a video capture as i told you so you could always draw frames from it right so so really you're looking at about 100000 plus images uh as the data set based on which these results are but a lot of what we do is sort of uh, i mean it's not continual learning but sort of batch learning which happens periodically right so everything every interaction that happens on the app where it's been used uh, amounts to us collecting more data and so so i hope i was able to answer your question okay i have uh, i have another addition to that question uh like does your model also uh in uh, near real time identify which goats are not uh, doing well and uh, uh through an android phone uh like where the model runs on the phone uh, offline without any cloud backup or internet connectivity in that case in that case if you have like a herd of goats uh, so does the model tell that okay goat 1 is not eating properly uh, goat 3 uh, you know is not uh, uh, is is like erratic in the behavior uh, right so all these have a uh, impact on the buying pattern of the goats uh, whatever the primary end is like whether it is like Uh, again another person raising the same goat or slaughtering the goat yeah so, uh, so so i think i have two questions so let me take it in two parts so first the model that we have deployed actually runs on the device right uh, uh, which means uh, technically you don't need to be connected to the cloud 
um, uh, for the inference, right? Now, of course, the app today is configured so that we also take a lot of that data and send it for training. So that aspect would be restricted if there was no network, right? So, so that's to answer the first question, which means today the model already runs on the Android phone, right? The model that I, uh, the the video that I showed you, the 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 is actually the model is running on the phone. Now, uh, coming to the second aspect, um, that's what we want to do, right? Today, the technology is where I'm able to uniquely identify the goat. Now, we need to formulate the problem of whether a goat is healthy or not, and whether it can be identified from an image or not, a little more concretely. We are not yet there, but that's basically where we want to be going in terms of the evolution of face ID tech. So we don't yet have uh, the technology in place which tells you whether just by taking a picture the goat is healthy or not yet, but that's where we want to go. Today it's only at a point where we are able to uniquely ID the goat. Uh, oh, okay, okay, I got it. Okay. Yeah, so like, uh, uh, yeah, so is it like, only for Android or does it also work for iOS? Currently it's only on Android, but Android. I, I, I don't see why we should not be able to do it on iOS. Uh, I mean, uh, because most of our ecosystem uh, has Androids, so that's basically why we picked that, yeah. Oh, so then how about uh, Raspberry Pi devices or the, uh, or the, uh, or the IoT uh, kind of, you know, miniaturized compactors yeah. which have like camera? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't see a challenge. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the model inference should not be a problem. Uh, even if you take a Raspberry Pi with some kind of an accelerator plug to it, these models should work. There should be no problem. Yeah. So the model okay. itself is not tied to the device uh, per se, right? Uh, 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 the kind of framework we use can be taken into any edge devices, uh, IoT devices, which have some compute of the edge. Uh, okay. That should be. Okay, so you have this development going in Bangalore or uh, some other place? Uh, our core team sits in Bangalore, uh, but uh, oh. a lot of the data collection happens in the big mandis, Anantpur, uh, and uh, there are two farms that we have, big farms, one in Coimbatore, one in uh, Bangalore. So that's where a lot of the data collection happens. Uh, and uh, I mean, our uh, operations and trading team is uh, all over India. Uh, we have presence uh, right from Rajasthan all the way the south uh, and uh, I mean each one of our operations team actually has the app on their phone with the, where they help us with the data collection. So okay, I mean we are collecting data pan India. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, CJ has a question. Go ahead. Hi, uh, great session by the way. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to know, I mean, since you mentioned it's very similar uh, to humans, human face rec, do you think uh, this can be generalized for other species? Absolutely, yes. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, the only uh, caveat I would place is, uh, I mean, even when uh, our team started to work on face ID, uh, uh, we we never thought that we could separate goats based on a picture, right? Because it's, I mean, as humans, I mean, at least for me, when I got into this problem, I said, oh, there's no way. But we figured out that, yeah, there are there are enough variations between goats that can be picked up. So if that is the bottom line, then absolutely, it can be scaled to any. Uh, so I don't see anything that's so special about a goat of why this should work only for goats and not for any other species. Thank you. Uh, Vishwanatha, you have a question, go ahead. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my question is, uh, so we have come across uh, a robbery of sheep, similar to a goat. Um, so how to handle uh, such issues by this technology. If we, if, since I come across the GPS uh, technology, but the thieves may 
um, may, they may have uh, handle those things like how to get rid of those those devices uh, once the once they still the go to our ship um, but by this technology uh, is there anything else to handle such issues? so i mean if uh, i mean uh, so i mean i can give you my perspective but uh, perhaps uh, manju or aryaman because they also are on the ground they can add in but uh, uh, i mean it's definitely better than let's say you place a gps and the gps has been plugged out which means uh, and uh, you are not able to the only situation where you can trace it is let's say the goat was stolen and uh, you found that that could be your goat and when you go and check that it is indeed your goat i mean that's one way i think uh, a face id kind of a tech can help but if the goat has been really taken out of your sight and to an unknown location i don't know how face id can directly help uh, i don't know if uh, manju or eman if you have any thoughts uh, because uh, this no, is a major yeah. issue. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's being happening in a village side as well, uh, so that is. To, yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, it's an interesting point. Uh, yeah. At some point, we will think of. Uh, if you know the location, uh, then you can verify whether it's your goat or not, uh, right? But if you don't know the location of the goat after it is stolen, I guess it is uh, challenging. Right? We also need to think. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I will give uh, my my take on this. Uh, so no doubt uh, your answer is correct. Uh, it, it depends on the location. But let's assume that at some point this goat comes back to the mandi under a different ownership. Yeah. And uh, you know if there is some sort of a regulation that an app has to be used to ID the goat, then you know we can pick it up. So people will be of course cautious to bring the goat back to mandis. Of course, yeah, this is another it. method uh, which can solve. Yeah. So there is a, another question online from John. I'll read out the question. How do these models want perform? To, uh, sorry, uh, if somebody wanted to tell something. Another suggestion. It would be. I will come back to that. Yeah. Okay. No uh, how do these models perform as the goat ages? Does it hold well for a year or so, etc.? Especially since you intend to build a super goat that can be tracked over a longer time. That's a very good question, uh, and uh, the short answer is I don't have enough data to give you a concrete answer, uh, right? Uh, uh, I mean, because a lot of the use cases that we see uh, are uh, in the trading context, where uh, I mean, really, from when the goat is ID to when it probably disappears from this planet is a short uh, distance. But in a farming setup, we completely, I mean, we, we are already cognizant of this point. We are actually trialing to see whether, uh, uh, you know, over time, how to sort of efficiently use this technology. It could be that a picture is taken once a year, pretty much like how it happens with us. But uh, that's a real problem. Uh, I fully acknowledge it. Uh, uh, I mean, once it has become an adult, we don't uh, see that that playing a big role, but I think uh, during the journey of it from its birth to reaching adolescence or whatever is that you know seven eight month time frame, we have to do more experiments to know to give you an answer. But that's a consideration that we are already thinking, uh, and uh, we I, I don't have enough data to tell you uh, whether it will work or not. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, my I have a question on the biotech angle. So, uh, you, in any of the things that you said under biotech, uh, there is uh, breeding. Talk about breeding. So, what is the regulation from the Indian authorities on breeding or uh, genetic engineering? I I think it's heavily regulated, uh, right? Uh, and which is why we are looking at a longer uh, horizon. Uh, for uh, that piece, uh, uh, let's say. So, but I think for us, the first level of breeding is the traditional breeding, where you're looking for uh, males which have uh, very good uh, characteristics and uh, corresponding females which are, you know, high yielding, high milk kind of pedigree. That's what we are thinking as a first step, uh, and sort of use the right nutrition interventions, uh, right. Uh, 
so that's what we are thinking but i think our 5 to 6 year uh, kind of uh, horizon is where we are looking at more interventions such as crispr which is uh, uh, around uh, you know a, a genetic engineering uh i mean from what i know and manju can add uh, is uh, i think it's very hazy there currently i think it's it's probably not allowed but i think uh, the space should evolve uh, as we take on this journey so i mean we are a very early in that game <laughs> as well okay, okay. Parvind, yeah. yeah so that's the answer and uh, you talk about male and female i think in one of your slides the ratio was uh, lopsided Looks yeah. like seventy percent male. Why is it like that? I was. I curious. mean, that's the, that's the reality of what you see in Mondays. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I mean, you. I mean, the males are what are butchered. I mean, sent out to be butchered. Right. Okay. Okay. Females are always kept to for breeding. Uh, I mean. Or for milk or. Uh, exactly. For exactly. other purposes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because I think the 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 point of owning a goat in a very marginalized farmer is the is is. Uh, once the goat is sold the next set of goats are getting ready right <laughs> the kids which will be sold eventually so yeah. the, the females are always uh, sort of used for breeding while uh, i mean you see a lot of males uh, yeah that's okay that's any further questions or follow up uh, from earlier questions one quick thing on the numbers you showed the accuracy you reported two accuracy numbers i understand accuracy with respect to finding a goat what is the accuracy with respect to registering a goat uh yeah so the accuracy with respect to registering a goat is the following right so what happens sometimes is uh, uh there are 10 goats that are already registered right now mm-hmm. i am trying to register a new goat Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens sometimes is the model says that this is a regi- the goat that's already registered. Okay. Right. Similarly, uh, the other way, right, which is uh, a goat is already registered, you can probably re-register another goat. Uh, both of these are scenarios which we considered as false. Okay. Okay. False. Got it. That is interesting. Thanks. Thanks that was a nice session. Thank you.